to Orinoco Tribune's special interview with a Palestinian author and activist Khaled Barakat, who is joining us today directly from Lebanon. And he was going to talk about the events that are happening in that part of the world. So today, I mean, this is like 3rd October, we are almost at the completion of one year since the start of the Palestinian resistance's Al-Aqsa flood operation of October 7th, 2023. And we have characterized it as the event that shattered the Zionist occupation's complacency in its rather baseless belief of invincibility, of course, backed by the US empire. And since that time, the operation has turned into a war in, I would say, all senses of the term, and it has expanded to encompass the entirety of the region that is called the Middle East. Simultaneously, since October 8th, the Zionist entity has unleashed a genocide in Gaza, taking more than 41,600 lives as of date and injuring some 100,000 people, with uh, more than 70% of the dead and the wounded being children and women. So, of course, it's a genocide. And the occupation warplanes have bombarded schools, hospitals, and mosques, and have turned into rubble entire residential areas in Gaza City and in other urban areas of the Gaza Strip, and of course announced an ethnic cleansing plot as the final solution to the Palestinian question. During this time, while the United States and its allies, as usual, have defended the Zionist entity's right to defend itself and even its right to exist, which is not extended to other countries and nations, and are sending weapons and warships to the settler colonial entity. The axis of resistance in West Asia announced moral and material support for the Palestinians. And among this axis of resistance members, I would say that Lebanon has featured prominently with its uh, resistance movement Hezbollah accompanying its Palestinian counterparts since the first day. And consequently, throughout this period, Lebanon has been a target of the Zionist entity as much as Gaza has been. And recent, in recent days, the situation has escalated rapidly, with the, first with the Zionist electronic terrorism in Lebanon, then the assassination of Hassan Nasrallah, and then combat, ongoing combat on the southern border regions, and then Iran's retaliatory strikes on the occupation's military installations, and I believe that it will go on. So in this situation, Orinoco Tribune considers it essential to look at various aspects of the situation in this region and what it implies for anti-imperialism throughout the world. So in order to discuss these issues, so as I already said, we are joined by Khaled Barakat here, who is associated with Masar Badin, the Palestinian Alternative Revolutionary Path Movement. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Khaled, for coming here and welcome back because you have been here so many times. You're almost like one of us. Thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be with you. Okay, so I think Dalal will take over from here and then I... So, there's a lot that has happened in the past few days. Um, the first thing we wanted to start with is asking about the assassination of Syed Hassan Nasrallah and the reaction of people in Lebanon and the reaction of uh, the the movement as a whole, as well as whether or not the, there are indications that the Zionist escalation following this and this event itself are moving to kind of end the sectarian divisions that have really plagued Lebanon for decades. Yes, uh, of course, this is a very important and central question. Uh, the uh, assassination of Sayyid Hassan Nasrallah, an iconic, exceptional leader for us. Uh, we view him uh, very much like how Latin America view Ernesto Che Guevara and iconic revolutionaries across uh, the world. But Sayyid Hassan Nasrallah was uh, an exceptional leader, thinker, scholar, um, and a fighter. Uh, and I think the question is not Israel being successful in using, you know, U.S. technology, throwing 85, uh, you know, um, bombs uh, in a, you know, on one building in order to assassinate him. The question also 
uh, is how come Israel failed in assassinating Hassan Nasrallah uh, uh, in 40 years? You know, this is not the first attempt uh, that Israel have, you know, carried to uh, kill uh, Sayyid Hassan Nasrallah. They have tried many times uh, in the past and they have failed. And this time, of course, with U.S., Britain, the NATO uh, support, uh, they were uh, successful. And uh, we have to acknowledge that uh, we have lost a great leader. leader. But at the same time, you know, Sayyid Hassan Nasrallah, uh, every day's work, his everyday tasks was to build for the future. And that's why he have personally uh, participated in building the institutions that will carry out the resistance and the task of the resistance. In fact, he talked about this all the time. I don't recall of any of his speech that he did not remind us and remind the people that he is with us temporarily and that he might be uh, killed or he might die at any uh, you know uh, moment. And so he always advised fighters, leaders, cadres, people in general, to always be committed to the resistance and to the path of a revolution in order to, uh, because this is not an individual uh, project, this is a project of a nations and of generations to come. However, I have to admit that we're still in denial. We cannot accept the fact that he is no longer with us, but the resistance have immediately managed to uh, prioritize its, its tasks, especially the internal tasks. And uh, there's a lot of, you know, misinformation that it's happening on, you know, uh, Zionist media, Arab reactionary media, Western media on this issue, especially when they talk about, you know, the eliminating of all you know, Hezbollah leaders. I mean, this is just a you know, a joke. I mean, how come, who are these people that we're meeting with? They're not Hezbollah leaders. These are the leaders we, we've we known. These are the leaders we always uh, known. And uh, they're there and they're carrying their tasks. Yes, they have assassinated some central uh, figures in the leadership. But because Hezbollah is based on institutions, every leader have a deputy. Some of these departments in Hezbollah have two deputies, three deputies. And the reason they do this is because they're in daily confrontation with the Zionist enemy. And they know that any day uh, a leader could be uh, killed or uh, maybe, you know, um, have different tasks. And so there is always the easiest thing as Sheikh Naim Qasim, the Deputy General Secretary said in his last speech, that these are easy tasks to replace a leader. Uh, because we do have uh, leaders uh, and uh, Hezbollah uh, will just uh, do that. And so these are the internal tasks, the immediate tasks that the resistance have dealt with, and they were very successful uh, on, on this front. Uh, now they are discussing the next general secretary of Hezbollah. And I think that... Uh, they have reached the decision. They probably will announce it in the coming few days. And they have also started immediately working with everybody. There is a sense of national unity here in Lebanon that I have never witnessed before. And the internal front is very strong. Of course, there are, you know, one individual here or one, you know, political line here. You, you always see that. I don't I don't know of any country that doesn't have that. But overall, there is a very strong national unity and a sense of national unity across the board, really. And this is one of the achievements, actually, of the resistance and of Laksa Flood and of Sayyid Hassan Nasrallah personally. And that is the unity of the people and that to be flexible, uh, you know, and be patient when it comes to internal uh, matters. So I do feel that there is a strong internal uh, front here in Lebanon and the back of the resistance, if uh, I may use this uh, uh, word, is secure. 
Uh, I just want to remind uh, people and ourselves of how sensitive the internal communication of the resistance is, uh, and they don't take this lightly at all. I mean, the resistance is willing to be flexible on every political front, on every arena, uh, internal matters. They're very patient. They're very, um, you know, um, able to have a dialogue. But when it comes to the internal security of the sensitive, this is a zero tolerance issue for the resistance. That's why in May 2008 was the first time that uh, Hezbollah and the resistance have took a surgical operation internally in order to secure their landlines and their internal communication because they cannot afford to lose that. And now people understand why. They understand that if you take this issue lightly, we could lose someone like Sayyid Hassan Nasrallah and many other leaders. Well, thank you. Um, I wanted to follow up and ask, so after the martyrdom of Hash Qasim Soleimani, there is the sentiment that the martyr Soleimani is more dangerous to the enemy than the general Soleimani. Um, I'm wondering if you if, if you think this also applies to Zayed Hassan Nasrallah and um, kind of his his uh, after his assassination, what we've seen in the the Arab world as a whole, and what in what he's going to represent, I suppose. I know it's kind of shortly soon after; it's less than a week ago. But um, I think the sentiment is important to could talk about I mean this is this is uh, also a very important question because uh, Sayyid Hassan Nasrallah have many roles uh, and many tasks that he uh, would carry but one of the most important roles that he played is that he always communicated with the popular cradle of the resistance and kind of gave a report public report uh, every, you know, couple of weeks he will appear. And he is more than just a leader, you know, who will give a report to the, a government or to a parliament. He is exceptional. He gave a report to the nation. And he, of course, addresses the supporters of the resistance, not just in Lebanon, but in the Arab world and the Muslim world and across uh, West uh, Asia. I mean, uh, Every every speech he gave, uh, you know, it's important for Muslims across the world, in India, in Pakistan, in Afghanistan, in Iraq, and every, everywhere. And also the topics that he also, uh, you know, discussed. And so there is always the sense of communication line, although people don't see him physically and they don't shake his hand or be in the same place with him but he's always there. In the case of uh, martyr Qasim Soleimani, uh, he was always with the soldiers and the fighters, uh, sometime to the extent where Sayyid Hassan Nasrallah will tell him, this is too much, you have to cool it down, because you can't go into the front lines, you can't just be with the fighters all the time. I mean, it's important that you have more sense of uh, security for your own security. So, but General Qasim Sulaimani was a was a military, uh, you know, leader with a rich experience. But he was a soldier, and he his best times were to be with the fighters, with the soldiers, uh, and talk to them. And so he didn't really have a traditional political role, but he understood the strategic. Uh, you know, uh, questions, and he dealt with it from the battlefield. Um, at the same time, I think that the two uh, leaders were uh, very much, uh, they have a lot of similarities uh, in terms of, you know, their commitment to the cause, um, and that they knew uh, that they have a, a central role, and they were almost fighting with time. They want to 
speed things up to the extent that they leave something uh, for you know next generations and the assurances of victory. And I think they both have done this with an excellent uh, measures. Okay, so I, I'd, I'll take it from there, and especially especially because of the assassination, not just of General Soleimani, which took place some time ago, but the recent two high-profile assassinations, I would say, first of Ismail Haniyeh of uh, Hamas and now of Syed Hassan Nasrallah. So in this situation, since you mentioned leaving something for the next generation, so what is what do you think would be the path forward for the next generation of the resistance, including you know, leaders, members, supporters, anyone, uh, especially given that these two leaders had been in the vanguard of these two organizations, the most uh, let's say most important resistance organizations in the region for decades, you know, and I especially ask this because um, there is a cult of personality in the West and uh, in other parts of the world. So whenever you lose a leader, of course, it's a chaos, but how do you think is the organizational structure holding up both of uh, Hezbollah and of Hamas with their two leaders gone? I think we are offering the world a different set of values and culture, and especially that the West, they take the position of a leadership as a, a job that they get paid for, uh, whether it's a president or prime minister or a member of parliament. And we know that their role, uh, sometimes their only role is to lie to the masses and to the people and to deceive them and to tell them how great they are and they should vote for their party. And we know that they're usually uh, talking heads uh, and they have no values. Uh, they, uh, their policies is based on their interest and they justify this, uh, you know, all the time. And we know that they are puppets for the military industrial complex, they're puppets for oil companies and they're willing to sell their mothers for their own uh, money. Our leaders is different. Our leaders, the resistance leaders, is there because they, <clears throat> that's why you see their funerals, you know, in millions participate in their funerals. I want to see you when Trump dies or when Biden dies or when all these people, you know, like uh, business uh, uh, politicians, who knows about these people? What do they leave? as a legacy, zero, nothing. Uh, but our culture is different. As a Muslim and Arab civilization, we have a different culture. We offer, you know, and of course there are those, you know, kings and princes and, uh, you know, sellouts, uh, uh, Arab leaders and puppets. But at the same time, we see that we have at least a, a different set of people's uh, value. And that's why I think it's important that when we talk to different uh, cultures that doesn't, uh, you know, uh, speak our language or have different, you know, sets of, uh, of values that we see where do uh, the commonalities are, where do we have the, you know, common principles are. So if it's a humanity, for example, which is, you know, a central issue, we are defending human rights based on what we believe uh, what human rights is and how to defend human rights. We are not going to take the definition of human rights based on Western, you know, um, description of what human rights is. Uh, you know, the same goes on democracy, rules of uh, law, all of these issues, we just have a different understanding of it. And the West doesn't want that. The West wants to impose, especially the imperialist West wants to impose uh, their uh, law on people that have different cultures and different understandings of their social and economic and, and political lives. And until now, we are as nations, you know, in West Asia, particularly in West Asia, we are facing colonialism until now. 
we are confronting occupations. We are still in the era where we have sultans and kings and princes. We want to get rid of these regimes uh, that is supported by Israel and the, and and you know the United States. We don't think that they represent the uh, you know the people. Uh, we think that they are um, you know uh, the uh, what do you call the medieval you know uh, uh, regimes and and people are rising up. And we saw that in the last you know fifteen years there was a lot of work done by the U.S. and Israel to divide our people to ensure you know Shiites and Sunnis and Ismailis and you know Zaydis and this and that. And the resistance is kind of the glue that brought the nations back. And so that's why the unity of the people of our region is based on our people upholding the resistance as a collective salvation to enter the, you know, the future and not just to fight. Uh, you know, these are not just groups with military might and military missiles. These are the groups who are promising for a different future for our people. It's a really important uh, acknowledgement that the resistance is a culture. It's more than just the way it's reduced to in a lot of media being all these armed groups or however it's dismissed. That's it's very important that a lot of people don't understand. And there's a lot that a lot of people around the world don't understand about what's happening. And one of those is um, there's, a, you know, after the past two weeks of what has happened, the terrorist attacks against Lebanon, um, there's a very pessimistic tone up until, I would say, Operation True Promise 2. Um, in terms of, you know, this especially with the Zionist entity there. They've announced a ground operation. It seems yesterday they started uh, some limited operations and then you know, they got crushed, uh, it seems like. Uh, they took some heavy casualties from Hezbollah. Uh, what would you... First off is, um, what would you say to folks who feel like, you know, oh, the resistance is done, we've lost so many important figures, there's been, you know, so much death, like especially, you know, I think 750 or 800 Lebanese people killed in one day last week. What would you tell folks who are, who feel like this is, you know, it's over, or it's very pessimistic about things? I will tell them to, uh wake up and stand up and, you know, condemn Israel crimes. If Israel killed 800 Lebanese, then Israel is a criminal and we should condemn Israel crimes. Uh, Israel have killed over 41,000 Palestinians in Gaza and tens of extra thousands are under the rubble. Uh, who do we blame? It's the killers. The United States, Israel, and their backups. These are the forces who have been killing people uh, on a daily basis for the past one year, um, nonstop. And so that's to, to these people, I say, know your enemy. These are the enemies who are killing our people. Now, the resistance uh, that we have today in uh, Palestine and in Lebanon, we didn't have that uh, strong resistance in the 90s. And the resistance in Lebanon were able to defeat Israel and liberate the South with simple guns and, 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 and explosives. Now the resistance in Lebanon is stronger than ever. And we saw what happened yesterday. Now Israel is, you know, always covering its losses, but the focus of the resistance is to hit military installations, military you know, soldiers, and so on and so forth. And yesterday, they were testing the will of the resistance, and over 80 Israeli soldiers were hit directly. Eight got killed, but 70 are, over 70 are injured. And so, you know, this was like, don't mess with us. We're still strong. Uh, 
the resistance in Lebanon today uh, uh, is almost 100,000 fighters, and the elite's fighter units of the resistance is over 5,000, and Israel understands that it cannot invade Lebanon anymore. Uh, that time is gone, uh, and if they try to invade the South, they will be defeated, and they will <laughs> they will no longer have tanks, just like Sayyid Hassan Nasrallah promised. Uh, now, all of these uh, facts on the ground that the resistance have been, you know, uh, achieving in the last 48 hours with the true promise to operation that was carried by Iran and the escalation by the Palestinian resistance in Gaza, the Yemeni's resistance, the Iraqi resistance have shifted uh, the entire situation. And I tell these people that, you know, this is not about one operation or two operations. This is in this is an open confrontation against the Zionist settler regimes. And this war is going to continue for a long time. You know, for those who think that this is going to be a very short battle, I tell them to that's not the case. And the resistance is actually ready for a very, very long uh, war. And so we see that there is no other options that we have except to continue the resistance and to defeat Israel. Because the other options that Israel is offering us is surrender, is becomes uh, slaves for the Zionist regime, is becomes puppets for the imperialist forces, uh, is just give up on our hopes and dreams, and that, you know, we should just sit down and watch them blundering our resources and, you know, uh, stealing our, uh, you know, the future of our uh, children and our, you know, next generations. That's not going to happen. And that's exactly the war that is happening today in Palestine, in Lebanon, in Yemen, in Iraq, and elsewhere. Uh, and this is a camp of resistance that have the vast majority popular majority support of our region. And, you know, if, you know, few people don't have trust in the resistance, well, fine, what can we do? They can just go and, you know, have their intellectual discussions in their cafes and their, uh, you know, salons. But uh, the people of the region is with the resistance. Following on that, um, you spoke about the, the true promise to operation. Um, seems like there's you know, every month is a new a new strain or a new flavor of anti-Iran propaganda that's being spread everywhere. After the assassination of Syed Hassan Nasrallah, there was uh, all sorts of Zionist accounts coming out trying to like, blame Iran for this and saying, oh, Iran has mules and this happened, or like, Iran let it happen. And then there was all this uh, about President uh, Dr. Pazeshkian, Mahmoud Pazeshkian, being, you know, uh, weak or some other thing going on. Um, there's lots of confusion. And then, you know, as we know, just less than 24 hours ago, we saw um, we saw what weak, how weak Iran was, right? Not weak at all. Um, what would you say? Like, how would you analyze this development of the role that Iran is playing, um, and the kind of complex campaign to continually paint Iran in a negative light for for Arab audiences, for global audiences, for etc. Yes, this is important about what Iran's role is uh, in this uh, region um, and uh, also the Iranian position uh, on this, you know, late in the last year. This is also important. And of course, uh, Iran retaliation uh, uh, in, you know, true uh, promise one and true promise two. Now, since the it's, it's really important to just say this. Since 1979, 
and the victory of the revolution in Iran. Not one single day that the Western powers and imperialist and Zionist and Arab reactionary regimes did not uh, try to punish Iran and the people of Iran. Economic sanctions, wars, wars that have killed hundreds of thousands of people in Iran without Iran being the aggressor. Um, you know, they try every crime in the book against Iran. And now after, you know, for over four decades, we see that Iran is a major regional power. And that's what the West don't like. The US and Israel don't want to see any country uh, in this region that is strong, uh, strong in their political uh, influence, in their uh, economy, in their education, in science, in any of this. Look, Pakistan have nuclear weapon. How much of a campaign you see against Pakistan having nuclear weapon? They don't even mention that uh, anywhere. Why? Because the nuclear weapon of Pakistan uh, uh, you know, it's uh, supervised by the U.S. And the Pakistani regime is not like the Iranian revolutionary regime. It's different. Pakistan relation to Palestine, it's not like Iran, uh, you know, uh, relation to Palestine. Uh, from the first day of the victory of the revolution, Iran have been supporting the people's resistance in the region. Now, some people say, well, that's because Iran is looking for its interest. And that's good. It's good that Iran is looking for its interest. If Iran wasn't looking for their interest, we will oppose Iran. We want Iran to look behind their interests. We want Iran to have influence. We want Iran to have, you know, strong presence in, in the world. That doesn't bother us at all. And it shouldn't. It shouldn't bother anyone. Uh, at the same time, when we look at what's happening today, the U.S. and Israel and their puppets in the region does not understand the fact that Iran and the Arab world have been right next to each other since God created Earth, and that they are going to remain brothers and sisters and neighbors until the end of time. And Israel is the temporary uh, regime in the region. And what uh, the, the, the problem of our region is the Zionist regime, it's not Iran. And, you know, Iranians are not like, you know, colonialist settlers. Israel is the colonialist settler. It, Iranians didn't come from Germany and Canada and the U.S. to, you know, colonize our region. Israel brought all these settlers from all over the world. To, to, to dominate our region. And so these are facts, but they try to, uh, you know, mislead uh, people, of course, and say that, you know, the problem is Iran. Uh, now, if you look at, for example, a country like Bahrain, uh, you know, people wake up one day and this guy say, I'm changing Bahrain from like an emirate, uh, uh, and I will long, no longer be a prince, I will be the king now. And when you ask the people of Bahrain about their government, what would they tell? And over 90% of people in Bahrain don't want this regime. There are thousands of people in Bahrain in the you know, prisons, torture. This regime is supported by the US, and have a normal relationship with Israel. If you take a look at, for example, Egypt, where 60,000 political prisoners today in Egypt, and ask the people of Egypt, you know, would you, you know, since 1979, Egypt have a, a, a peace accord with Israel. Where is Egypt today? Where is Egypt influence? Egypt is almost like Iran in terms of population, in terms of geography, in terms of geopolitical positions, but Egypt lost its role. And so when you compare 
a country like Iran since 1979 have been facing all these sanctions and wars, compare it to Egypt that did not go into any war or face any kind of sanctions, and just compare the two places, and you'll see Iran is thousands of light years ahead of, of Egypt today. So that's what they don't like about Iran. And today, Iran have said to the, the U.S. and Israel that we will no longer tolerate Israel policies. They miscalculate the term strategic patience that Iran have. Strategic patience doesn't mean patience forever. It means something else. Iran is running out of patience now, and they are calculating, you know, their, uh, you know, strategic position in the region, and they are rightly uh, so to do so. But at the same time, Iran is willing, based on principles, not just based on interest, principles and interests, to um, confront any aggression against Iran. This is not Iran 1980. This is Iran 2024. And so that's why people in Gaza were cheering for the Iranian missile, is because they saw there is a force in the region that is willing to respond when Israel commits crimes. And, you know, Iran was actually kind of deceived by the U.S. after the assassination of Brother Ismail Haniyeh when they told him that, you know, we will have a ceasefire and we will stop Israel and their crimes and what they're doing in Gaza. And Iran said, OK, we'll give you some time and so do that. But they didn't. They went to Lebanon and killed Sayyid Hassan Nasrallah. What do they expect from Iran to send them a gift? Of course, it's going to send them hypersonic missile. And so that's what happened. And they just have to deal with, you know, Iran being a major force in the region and in the world. So oh, we'll continue with the uh, topic of Iran. I would just add one thing. I mean, it's just that people don't understand the, the power that the sanctions have. They are just called sanctions, which is a misnomer. Like it should be called unilateral coercive measures. They are to coerce people to overthrow their own governments. So there is a reason why they exist. And Iran has, I don't know, more than 3,000, I believe. I, I mean, I lost lose count. Every month there is something new, some new country imposes some new sanction on Iran. So it goes on, the list increases. And people don't really understand that, uh, That I mean, sanctions is also a weapon of war in the modern world. I mean, it used to be also in the middle of medieval world, it was siege. So it is exactly the same thing. And we have to understand that nothing has changed. So about the Iranian strikes, Okay, so, I mean, just after the strikes happened, there was uh, all these Zionist media, social media, etc. First of all, they tried to downplay it, that nothing was hit. Then they were accepting that, yeah, some military targets have been hit, but now they are changing their tone and saying that, okay, nobody was killed. Like, the, no Israeli was killed. So, how is it even a strike? How is it even a successful strike, which probably shows their priority? So I would just ask you about this one. What is Iran's priority as opposed to the Zionist entities' priorities? And do you think that Iran will continue with its this sort of surgical strikes or whatever it is, which may, they may be called, especially given that on the day of the strike, the Zionists were like running for cover and they did not attack anyone at that time. But after the strike stopped, last night they went ahead to attack, like violently attack Syria, bombed three cities. And I mean, they also bombed Damascus the day before that. So it's like, I mean, the moment there's, there is a, like Iran stops striking them, they go back to taking their frustration out on everyone else. So how, what are Iran's priorities? What are they going to do? Yes, uh, I, and they they killed over eighty people in Gaza. They now because they're failing in assassinating more leaders, they're attacking health workers and civic institution in Lebanon, and they're taking their frustration on people. You are absolutely right because 
there is not much that Israel could do. And the reason I say that when it comes to Iran particularly, and the reason that I'm saying this is because Iran could actually uh, retaliate in a way where uh, Israel infrastructure will be damaged. Iran doesn't want a war. And they have been saying this every day. But at the same time, they will have no tolerance of any Israeli aggression. I mean, we saw that for when Israel, you know, uh, attacked the Iranian embassy in Damascus, Iran responded. So you can imagine if Israel, for example, dared to strike, you know, oil facilities or energy facilities in Iran, what would be the Iranian response? It's not just going to be a response against Israel. It's going to be a response against Israel backers, particularly the U.S. military bases in the region. Is the U.S. will have no longer, uh, you know, any bases in Iraq, for example. Uh, their bases in Jordan will be hit. Their strategic assets in the Gulf will be damaged. And the Iranian response will be massive. Global crisis will happen. Oil prices will. The situation in you know the Arab Sea and Bab el Mandeb and the Red Sea will just be a different story. So, you know, and and I think the United States is very careful, uh, you know, about this. Uh, you know, a lot of people think that because the U.S. You know, um, traditionally, has been like the number one force in the uh, in the world, uh, especially after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, that is, you know, the U.S. could do whatever it wishes. It can't. It can do whatever it wishes. The U.S. is, you know, um, have no certainties anymore about its presence in the region. They pulled from Afghanistan. They're pulling from the area because the empire is shrinking. It has a lot of issues. There are a rise in, in you know, uh, in the East. And the West has to accept that the East is rising and that China is rising and that Russia is strong and they couldn't do anything uh, uh, to uh, Russia. That there are a camp uh, internationally today that supports uh, you know, our resistance supports also Iran, you know, in Latin America, in Africa, uh, you know, elsewhere. And uh, Iran, uh, you know, again, uh, keeps and they are they are actually, uh, you know, um, transparent about this. They don't want a war and not because, uh, you know, Iran is afraid of a war, but because it will not be a classic war in, in, in the sense of a classic war. I don't know what the what Iran uh, you know is going to do like in terms of actions, but I don't have a doubt in my mind that Israel and the US will be very sorry uh, you know if they attack Iran. And at the same time as a Palestinian and as an Arab uh, and Muslim person, I urge Iran, to actually have nuclear weapon to protect itself. Every time I speak to my Iranian friends, I tell them you should have nuclear weapon. No one should trust Israel and the US. And if the Iranian forces tomorrow start storming into Mecca, I will be the happiest person in the world. And if they take on Bahrain and Qatar and all the Arab Gulf countries, they they could do it in, you know in a in a blink of an eye. Iran is not a small country, you know, to to play with. And they're serious, and they have strategies, and they have been in war. These countries have never witnessed war, um, you know. And so, so I think that, you know, the U.S., the West needs to reevaluate their policies because the people of the region are fed up. The other thing is that these debates are happening in Iran. I mean. Westerns don't read Iranian press, but Iranians are debating every day 
you know, criticizing and, and, and talking and discussing, and they, they have different opinions, and this is great. But, you know, they think that we shouldn't have these debates and that it's only the West could have debates, only the West could have different political views. But the minute we do, you know, they call it division uh, and they call it all kinds of names, but they won't call it a debate. It's public debate. It's in the parliament, it's in the Iranian press, it's in the government. I mean, and it's fine. And, and only, you know, countries with a lot of confidence who actually have that. Yeah. Actually, it's it's nice to know that there are, I mean, debates in Iran because there are people. I mean, uh, it does be mentioned in the Western world, people might think that uh, only in the West there may be different kinds of opinions. There aren't actually. I mean, it may seem like there are different kinds of opinion, but in most cases there aren't. So most opinions are very similar or fall within a similar group, very close, etc. Anyway, so uh, th thanks a lot for all these uh, things, to good things about Iran. I like Talal will ask something and then maybe we'll just go around to close it up. Well, there's, there's a few other topics I wanted to touch on, but I actually, this, this is something that um, is really important. So over the past, um, I want to say like 10 days, uh, the resistance in Iraq has been carrying out significantly more operations, significantly more comprehensive operations. Um, you know, as as a Muslim, I suspect that it has to do with the uh, fatwa from Syed Ali Asistani um, about defending Lebanon. Um, I'm wondering if you could, you know, there's been this kind of ongoing dialogue in Iraq between the government of Iraq and the United States, like, oh yeah, we'll create this agreement where we'll leave soon. And then, you know, the US is saying we're not going to do that, then etc. cetera. Um, what has changed recently? Do you see, and do you see this front of Iraq um, and the Iraqi people mobilizing in a way that will change the equations of this current or in, in its current stage? Absolutely. And Iraq is the next major force that it's coming, and not just in terms of the resistance, which has already uh, reached over 200,000 soldiers, just the resistance, not the Iraqi army. And at the same time, they are accumulating their force, they are strengthening their presence, they're carrying joint military operation publicly with the Yemenis resistance and with the Yemenis forces. And this is very important because it's strengthening the unity of our people. At the same time, Iraq is a very rich country. And, uh, you know, if you walk in the streets of Beirut, uh, the the, the you know you can't miss the Iraqi community here. It's the largest Iraqi community that comes to Lebanon and invest actually invest in Lebanon. Uh, and at the same time, it was the first country to send humanitarian shipment and medicine. And it's not done as a favor to Lebanon. It's done based on duty and commitment to Lebanon. At, at the same time, Iraqis are across the board, they're looking at their own national interest and not to please the U.S. Uh, and this is also a, a major, um, you know, popular uh, uh, consensus in, in Iraq. Uh, the same goes on Palestine, uh, you know, and their support for the Palestinians. And it's important to have Iraq equivalent to kind of Venezuela and Latin America, which is, a you know, a country with a lot of capabilities and economic, uh, particularly their economic uh, capabilities to, to uh, you know, support, uh, you know, the resistance and support, uh, you know, uh, people and invest in, uh, in, in favor of the Iraqi uh, economy as well. And so there's a lot that Iraq could benefit also from, uh, you know, Lebanon, from you know, other uh, Arab countries like Syria uh, uh, on economic uh, level. And, and this is important. You know, 
Iraq and Iran have fought for eight years where a lot of people died and a lot of you know capabilities were lost. And now we see that Iraq and Iran have a different relationship. And this is important, especially that the two countries uh, belongs to the same region. They, you know, um, and we see we see that in, for example, the anniversary of Al Karbala and Al Hussein, where twenty million people have participated in this from across, uh, you know, the Arab and Muslim world, including from Gaza itself. You know, where people are finding Iraq as a uh, uh, you know, a major force that is rising. And I think that we are going to see kind of a different Iraq in the, in, in the uh, you know, in the near future. Also, uh, U.S. allies like Jordan, for example, you know, they're putting themselves kind of in the, as we say, in the front of the tank to defend Israel and, and the U.S., and I think that if the Jordanian regime is going to continue with this path, this King Abdullah II were not going to last. What we are seeing is a shift in terms of like people's uprisings. It's now in the heart of the monarchies. It's in Bahrain, it's in Jordan, it's in Morocco. It's people rising against monarchies. They thought that they are going to be safe you know, in the so-called Arab Spring. But now things are shifting. And if there is a spring, a true revolutionary Arab Spring, it's now. It's where people and the resistance and the compass is Palestine and not, you know, U.S. puppets and Zionist, you know, um, uh, puppets. And so it's really important that we see Iraq as a cornerstone in the you know, axis of resistance and the camp of resistance. Uh, and I think that uh, Iraq is promising. Hmm. You say it is actually, a, it is sort of like Iraq rising like a phoenix because uh, I remember that I was a little, very little, I was a child when the United States invaded Iraq and it was, it actually caused a huge impact. I remember that, uh, even though I was a child, it caused a huge impact in the collective psyche because Iraq is the cradle of the human civilization and how not only they bombed everything, but they also like sacked museums and tried to erase history. So like erasing history like uh, is like erasing collective memory so that you would never remember that it, this was the land of civilization. This was where human beings learned many things, like almost everything to be humans today. So uh, I also recently found out, I mean, I knew that since 2019, the US and Iraq, US has been promising that it will be leaving Iraq soon. That soon has not yet come. It has been five years. And to this day, the United States gets the oil revenue from Iraq. I mean, every penny of Iraqi oil that is sold by the government, I mean, that goes to the US Federal Reserve. I didn't know this. I mean, I knew that it used to happen. I did not know that it is still continuing. So one can imagine the sacking of wealth. It is colonialism. It is continuing to this day. It's very similar to, I mean, it's not, it's not like there is sanctions, but it is very similar. It's wealth is being drained away just like colonialism used to happen. So I hope that this situation comes to an end very soon. And I hope also that the Iraqi resistance wins against its puppet government, or at least uh, gets this government out of the puppet mode. I don't know what to say about it. So I'll just, uh, from there, I'll just uh, maybe take it to the other fronts, because this is the entire region is at war, as it seems. Um, the, there are several fronts in the Al-Aqsa flood is not just, uh, I mean, in, in my view, it's not just uh, limited to Gaza or to Palestine, but it has been like throughout the region. So it has been, like I said at the beginning, I mean, we are almost at the one year anniversary. So what do you think? Uh, that uh, what do you think are the major achievements that the resistance, not just the Palestinian one, but in the entire region, Lebanon, even Iraq, maybe Syria, have achieved during this time, this one year? Yes, uh, and just quickly, uh, you know, the wealth of the people of Iraq will be taken back by the Iraqi people and the U.S. will leave very soon if it's not uh, willingly, it will go. They will leave by force. Uh, and as I, uh, I look at the Yemeni's example, all the oil 
in Lebanon is under the so-called legitimate government of Aden, but they cannot, the British and the US companies cannot steal one drop of oil from Yemen because there's a Yemeni resistance. They will hit any ship that will take Yemenis or steal Yemenis oil. And so it's important to see that, yes, they're trying to control the oil and there is the, the resources of, of both Iraqi and Yemenis, but, uh, you know, this is coming to an end. As for the achievement of the Al-Aqsa flood, one of the strategic achievement is that before October 7th, we were witnessing the slaughtering of the Palestinian cause. Palestinians were in a situation where they were looking at their cause being literally taken to the slaughterhouse and that they were losing hope and they were in despair. Israel was attacking Gaza, besieging Gaza, attacking Al-Aqsa and stealing, you know, Palestinian land, building settlements, uh, doing all of their crimes. And it was being done under the eyes of the world and no one was saying anything. Palestine was disappearing as a cause. And at the same time, you know, the Arab regimes, especially Saudi Arabia, was just getting ready to sign a, a normalization pact with Israel. And this meant that the Saudis will push for uh, the vast majority of Muslim countries to normalize relationship with Israel. October 7th uh, was the choice uh, that, uh, or the path that we were pushed to, uh, the Palestinian resistance was pushed to. Uh, of course, people in general would like to achieve their rights without, you know, uh, war if they can. But we're fighting an enemy that we're not, it's not ready to, you know, even acknowledge the basic rights of the Palestinian people. And now the world is in a different uh, place after October 7th. And the you're right, the Al-Aqsa flood now, it's not just a Palestinian uh, or limited to the Palestinian situation. Uh, it's going to unify the masses of the region. It's going to give a strength and hope to a different world as possible. It's going to um, end U.S. hegemony in our region. It's going to unify the Palestinian people under the banner of a unified national resistance front. It have put an end to uh, the so-called Palestinian Authority to do their, uh, you know, business as usual and their, you know, relationship with Israel as a puppet. Uh, government in the West Bank to the Zionist. It's going to strengthening a birth of a new balance of power in the region. Now, of course, this is costly and Israel is uh, committing all these crimes uh, against our people. Uh, but this is not because of October 7th. This is because the Zionist regime is going down, it's sinking, and it's eating itself from within. Israel have no future in our region. The Zionist regime will collapse. They will not match the patience we have, uh, and they're not going to be able to recover uh, you know, their economic crisis, their political crisis, their, you know, internal divisions. And at the same time, we see that there are hundreds of thousands of Israelis began to leave because they have citizenship uh, elsewhere, their Westerns, you know. And if Germany cares about Israelis, they should take them if Israelis feel safe in Germany and they don't feel safe amongst Muslims then maybe Germany should take them, maybe Canada or Holland or any of these Western countries, maybe they can, you know, uh, establish Israel somewhere 
in uh, you know in Germany, give them a piece of land and have have them have Israel there. But Israel have no future in our region. This is a region that it's going to rise up and unify itself. Muslims are going to become a major force in the world, and the West has to just deal with it. And if they love Israel so much as their colony, uh, again, they should just take Israel somewhere else. As for Palestine, it's a land for not for sale. This belongs to every uh, person, not just Palestinians. It belongs to every person who um, have a relationship with Palestine, whether they're Muslims or they're, you know, um, Arabs or uh, Asians who have, you know, uh, Laksa and Al-Quds have a special meaning for them. Um, and it's not, it's again, Palestine is a, is a, is how our people uh, in the region measure whether they are rising or whether they are uh, not. And so the liberation of Palestine is the task of every person in Iran and Pakistan, Bangladesh and and you know, and, and and India and Egypt. It's not just the Palestinian cause; it's the cause of every revolutionary of the world and those who, uh, you know, uh, are committed to justice and liberation. So this is the important thing of make. I mean, establishing the Palestinian cause as a cause for justice and definitely liberation, independence because uh, it cannot be thought of as any other way. It has been uh, sort of uh, like propagandized as a religious war or something, but it is not. And it's good that people, are, I mean, most people today are realizing that they have been lied to. So uh, since we're talking of most people, I'll just uh, broaden this up. You have, uh, you already mentioned about China. So we just talk, maybe just talk, say that since Russia and China, especially China are considered to be the rising powers, the next superpower or whatever. So what do you think of their, I would say ambivalent attitude towards Palestine? Because of course they both go on supporting the two-state solution, which is also the United Nations position. But anyway, it's not just about, uh, United Nations, I mean, they, you can have your own position, countries can have their own position, and they sort of, in my opinion, they sort of shield themselves behind the United Nations resolutions and stuff and go on supporting a peace process, a two-state solution process or whatever. So how do you consider their role and do you think that they may be forced to reckon with uh, the new developments? Yes, uh, I mean, China is viewed in our region in a positive way. Uh, they do not view China as an aggressor. Uh, they view China as a friend. However, if a friend is going to be truthful to his or her friend, we have to say it as is. You know, China loves business more than they love uh, to be, you know, uh, playing a major political role in opposing Israel and the United States. China is the second largest partner of Israel after the U.S. We don't like this. And we say this to our brothers in China in a very flat way. China is not willing to give an inch from Taiwan, and they're asking us to give 78% of Palestine to Zionists. And they talk about two-state solution. We don't like this. They have one China policy. We respect that. We have one Palestine policy as well. Palestine is ours from the river to the sea. And every time Palestinians hear a Chinese official talking about two-state solution, it really bothers them and it hits them right into the heart. And China needs to stand up for principles, not just for, you know, its own interests, but for principles. And so we want China to be strong. We want China to be the number one superpower if they uh, can. That's, that doesn't bother us. And we want you know, stability and, 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 and peace for China, but also China needs to understand that it could play a better role, a more role in support of our region. The same goes to Russia, you know, and we understand that there is, a, you know, the interest of both countries sometime to be taken in consideration as long as it's not at the expense of our interest and of 
the people of the region interest. And so I think that, you know, the international system is collapsing. And I'm not just saying this. I mean, the General Secretary of the United Nations, Antonio Guterres, was asked a week ago about the international system. And he says, nobody respect the international system. This is a system that is failing. It's not doing its responsibilities. And so this rhetoric about like United Nations resolutions that Chinese and Russians sometimes try to talk to us about, it's uh, it's just rhetoric. I mean, we want to see real actions. Uh, one year of genocide and war crimes against the people of Gaza, honestly, like we ask China, like what exactly did you do? Did you try to even stop the Israeli genocide and war crimes? The only forces that is confronting the Zionist aggression and the U.S. aggression is, you know, Yemen, Iraq, Iran, uh, you know, the camp of resistance and the international anti-imperialist movement. And China is not looking at our region in a strategic way, I think. I think they're calculating it from like their relationship to the U.S., when we see the U.S. is actually not the same U.S. that was 30 years ago. Uh, of course, Russia understands what the NATO and Europe is trying to do to, to Russia with the Ukraine war and trying to, you know, uh, push Russia into uh, despair and siege uh, and, and isolation. And these are all U.S. public positions. I mean, it's not like we're saying that. The U.S. every day says we want to isolate Russia, we want to confront China, we want to push the... You know, I mean, this is U.S. And the Democrats and the Republicans are competing of who hates China more, who hates Russia more, you know? And I think that Russia and China needs to... It's good that they both have uh, strengthening their economic, military relationship, but I think it's important to understand that it's uh, it has to reflect itself on our region as well. You mentioned the um, the international anti-imperialist movement at that has that is aligned with Palestine. Um, there seems to be a sort of uptick in direct action efforts in the imperialist countries against weapons manufacturing companies. There's been a, a group that's a Palestine action in the UK and some actions in Canada and the US as well. Um, how would you evaluate the current status of the international anti-Zionist, anti-imperialist movements and the um, innovation or change over the last year? Okay, this is uh, really an important question because it signing petitions or, you know, uh, organize and mobilize in the streets. Obviously, these mobilizations did not stop the U.S. from attacking Afghanistan and occupying Iraq and doing all their crimes. Uh, so direct actions is very important to make it costly for any company that is going to be complicit in supporting war crimes. For example, in Canada, Scotia Bank invests over $500 million in the Elbit system that is literally killing our people every day and assassinating our leaders every day. So a direct action against Scotia Bank and exposing this bank for what it is, is also to raise the awareness about this unity between financial sector and the military sector in a bank. I mean, the bank is the, the, the representation of, of, of this, you know, uh, capitalist vicious uh, system that uh, you know exists in the in the West. At the same time, you know we cannot ask people to do more what they can, but we think that people can do more uh, in terms of mobilizing, uh, you know, the youth and the students, and to take more uh, of a 
you know, rebellion actions against their uh, governments because we need to remember that the money that the United States give Israel comes from the American people's pockets, from taxpayers. So it's not enough to hold the sign and say, I don't want my taxes to go to, you know, oppressing people in Africa or killing Palestinian people. What needs to happen is a shutdown of the system if they can do that, whether it's a university or a factory or a company or any of this, because this will show that people are gaining their power and reclaiming their own strength. This is for their own. Please continue. Uh, so I think that in the absence of a, a center for, you know, resistance against imperialism, uh, they should consider that our region now is the center. And so it's important to build bridges with our region. It's important to publicly support armed resistance. Uh, it's important to be very vocal and clear in, you know, in, in uh, you know, positions on this. And we have to just be honest with each other. This international anti-imperialist movement or this solidarity movement with Palestine or whatever you want to call it, have a different forces. Uh, the, the forces that it's fighting in our in our region against Zionism and imperialism are Hezbollah, Hamas, Islamic Jihad, the Popular Front, Hajj al-Shabi of Iraq, the Yemenis. These are the people who are on the front line. You don't want to support them? That's their problem. Uh, there are other trends who are supporting them. And one of those trends is like, you know, Palestine action, you know, Sami Dun, uh, you know, the, the, the Masar Badil movement, uh, many, many other youth and students organizations. And I think that we are the majority in terms of the movement. You know, um, for those who call for boycott, for example, that's good. Uh, we don't have a problem with people calling for boycotting Israel, but that's the minimum. It's not the maximum. It's the floor, it's not the seal. And, uh, you know, uh, at the same time, we always have a message for, like, some of the groups and the movement, like, for example, those who call themselves the Jewish peace for this or Jewish peace for that, that they're just part of the movement. They're not special. They shouldn't be treated as if they are very special people. They're just like everybody else, uh, you know, they're part of our movement and being Jewish doesn't make, give you, you know, you're not a superhero thing. You're just, uh, you know, there are Christians for Palestine, there are, you know, others for Palestine. And sometimes some of these Jewish groups, they want to say that they are in solidarity with Palestine, but they are for two state solutions. We don't like this. We think this is a liquidation of the Palestinian people. At the same time, you know, some of some of uh, these groups um, are uh, very liberal Zionists. They're not true revolutionary movers. We have, you know, Jewish comrades who are revolutionaries and say that they are for Palestine, for the liberation of Palestine, for the right of return. They support the armed struggle, but they're very few. In Palestine itself, uh, we there is not even one, 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 just one. Uh, Jewish martyr, for example, since 1948, someone who's Jewish person fighting for to liberate Palestine, you know, and like in the resistance, like that doesn't exist. In South Africa, whites used to join sometimes the ANC. They'll be part of the ANC. They'll fight. They'll be part of the struggle. But uh, in Palestine, Israelis those who call themselves progressive Israelis, you know, or left or, you know, peaceful or any of this, you will not find one political prisoner who are in Israel. You will not find a martyr or injured or any of this. They are absent. They want us to liberate Palestine so they can, you know, be with us in one state, you know. So, but if you don't struggle for Palestine, sorry, I mean, you're not, you're not part of our movement. 
just simply as that, you know, a, a, a Muslim brother or a Muslim sister who's fighting, you know, for their just cause anywhere in the Muslim world have more connection to Palestine than any so-called Israeli peace lover. And, and this has to be just very, you know, uh, clear. Um, because there's a lot of illusions that they spread, you know, about like, um, you know, Jewish progressive uh, voices. Um, it's just an it's just an illusion. It doesn't exist. Uh, there are Jewish progressive individuals, but there are not not one single, you know, Jewish revolutionary organization or Israeli, you know, progressive you know, uh, movement. It doesn't exist. It just does not exist. So, uh, I think that's a very, very important analysis that people are afraid to say. Um, and I thank you for that. I want to ask one follow-up here, uh, which is, so you use this phrase, liberal Zionism. Um, I'm wondering, Glenn, if you could kind of define this for our audience, and also if you could talk about like the, the importance of challenging that now, even though the war is at a is at a crescendo right now and it's only getting worse, why it's still important to disrupt and challenge liberal Zionist narratives, um, and possibly even more important today. So if we take a look at the situation of where the Zionist movement is today, uh, and we apply this on, let's say, the Zionist regime, you see Ben Gavir and Smotrich and Netanyahu likes, for example, and there are those who call themselves secular Zionists and uh, who also hate Palestinians as much as the religious Zionists do, uh, especially those so-called, you know, uh, families of the prisoners who wants to, you know, get back the Israeli captured in Gaza. Uh, they're not pro-Palestinian. These are saying, these are Zionist trends who tells the government of Israel and to get back the hostages from Gaza and then destroy Gaza. But don't destroy Gaza while the hostages is there. They're not pro-Palestinians. Some of these liberal Zionists try to promote this as if it's a movement in Israel. They're just uh, the same as Netanyahu and Ben Gavir and Smotrich. They want to see Palestinians gone. They support genocide. They're, they're war criminals. But they want to save their 100 Israeli captured because they're using them just like Netanyahu but in a bargaining chip and in an election uh, kind of, uh, um, you know, uh, game. Um, and that's one of the biggest achievement of the Palestinian resistance is that it showed the true face of Israel. They don't care about, you know, their captures or their Israeli soldier or non-soldier captured by uh, the resistance. But these liberal Zionists, they're more dangerous than Ben Gavir and Smotrich in so many ways. Because what they do is they're trying to sell you themselves as a, you know, tolerance and peace and negotiations and all that. But in real way, they, they want to achieve the Zionist goals of displacement and ethnic cleansing of Palestinians without any pressure from anyone. It's almost like those groups who were advocating for the Oslo agreements and for, you know, negotiations and peace with the Palestinian Authority and selling themselves as peaceful voices and that they are, you know, more tolerant than, uh, you know, these uh, figures like uh, the, 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 set, the settlement movement. But on the core, they agree with Ben Gavir and Smotrich on so many things. One is that Israel have the right to exist. Israel doesn't have the right to exist. Not even on one inch in Palestine. They advocate for two-state solution, yet they consider 
the West Bank to be Judea and Samaria, and it's promised to them by by by, by God. And, and some of them don't even believe in God, but they believe that God promised them the land. And third, they're trying to sell Israel as a a potential enlightenment for the, our region, as if you know uh, Israel could be the example to follow. Uh, you know. Uh, and these are very dangerous. You know, Ben Gavir and Smotrich say, we don't want to have any relationship with Muslims and Arabs. We want to force on them our, um, you know, the, the, the Zionist regime. Liberal Zionists, they say, we agree with you, but we want to do it differently. We want to do it in a nicer way. It take longer, maybe, uh, but it's better because Israel then gets away from any kind of international pressure. They care so much about international pressure more than they care about what's right and wrong and what's principle and what's not principle. Now, I can count the Israeli intellectuals who actually, um, you know, um, okay, like they, they, have a, they have an okay position. I can count them on my fingers, like they're few. And uh, as long as they live in Israel or, you know, is it, uh, I don't trust them. They have to leave, go somewhere else, and then talk about what they want to talk about. Like, you know, there are, there are individuals that, you know, we can uh, name, but they're very, they're very few. Uh, if they're settlers and they're getting all the benefits and privileges from the Zionist regime, I'm not sure if I believe their peaceful discourse. They they have to do more than that. They just have to leave Palestine, go live somewhere else, and then advocate for the liberation of Palestine. Our responsibility as Palestinians, which is to recruit more uh, Jewish people who are uh, interested in arms struggle, to be part of the Palestinian revolutionary arms struggle and to fight. Uh, you know, along with Palestinians. And, and I think that's important. You know, if you know any of a Jewish progressive revolutionary who wants to join the resistance, please let us know. But there are not, they're not, not many. Uh, you're going you're gonna to spend many years trying to find someone. But so that's that's the idea. We have to say it as is. We, we can't be diplomats when we see hundreds of thousands of our people being injured and over, you know, 50,000 people being killed and just, you know, try to be diplomat. It is, we have to say it the way it is, you know. Okay. Uh, since you have been mentioning these people, I mean, not just uh, Jewish, I mean, any sort of uh, Palestine solidarity and especially pro-peace people, people who mm, make peace their, f mm, I think uh, maybe their flag or whatever. So this kind of, especially for these people who are in the, well, who support Palestine, who say that they support Palestine, I have noticed that they especially when they're on media and when they're trying to highlight their, their positions, they also highlight the plight of the Palestinians and not their resistance. And so it seems like a sort of effort to, to get some sensibility or to appeal to the sensibility of their own people, I believe, their own audience. It could be the people they know in their own surroundings, I would say. So it is like they're trying to appeal to the sensibility, but... To, I mean, to think that this strategy could work, I mean, can you appeal to the sensibility of a regime that has no sensibility? And I'm not just talking about just the Zionists, but also the U.S. empire. I mean, to whom are they appealing? I mean, how do you evaluate this position of appealing for peace in a situation of war where a people has been under occupation and colonialism for I mean, centuries because the first there was the British and now it's the Zionists? I mean, exactly. I mean, because they start on the wrong foot, so everything else they say would be wrong. You know, they start on the premise that Israel is a state that is violating human rights. Israel is not a state that only violates Palestinian human rights. Israel is a settler colonialist project that is serving the imperialist forces 
and they're using Jewish people, speaking on behalf of the Jewish people, speaking on behalf of everyone who have the faith, uh, you know, uh, uh, whether they're, you know, uh, racist or not, and say that they represent that. And so when you start, when, you know, their discourse is actually rotten because they're trying to say that as if they're doing us a favor when they say, you know, Israel is violating human rights and Palestinians have rights, you know, and we should we should thank them, you know. And that's the problem, you know. They start with the on the wrong foot. You know, when Napoleon tried to occupy Palestine in 1799 and he had the very initial idea of a Jewish state, it was Napoleon, it was the French who started this whole thing, you know. And, and the one of the leaders of our resistance, like Sinwar of today or Muhammad Dev or you know, one of the leaders of, of the resistance in Lebanon was actually a Palestinian Jewish leader who was fighting Napoleon and who was he was Palestinian. So we, we don't have a problem with a person being Jewish for you know being Jewish. Is the problem is that these are Zionist, I don't know, Zionist light. Zionist liberals, I don't know what you call them, but they try to start from the beginning that Israel have the right to exist. Israel does not have the right to exist. That is what is important in this whole discussion. And if any person who, who like, you know, Jewish or not, you know, says that Israel have the right to exist, we will tell them that, you know, uh, you need to go and recheck uh, why Israel was established in the first place. Uh, this is this is important. You know, we say this to Palestinians, to Arabs, to Muslims, to everyone. Why can't we say it to a Jewish person just because they call themselves Jews for peace or Jewish for that? It, it doesn't make any sense. Um, you know, we some of these groups actually are struggling with each other to condemn Zionism. They still think that Zionism can be, you know, something good. I mean, why should we bother and even spend our time discussing issues with these irrelevant groups who are, when you count them, like they don't, they, they don't even, like they're not a, even a political force, like they don't influence anyone. And so, and they, I think they work for their own benefit. Some of them are NGOs who gets a lot of money and donations from different, you know, institutions in Europe and the U.S., and they spend it on themselves and salaries and they don't, you know, they don't dare to actually praise a Palestinian military operation or say that Palestinians have the right to resist, um, many of them. And some are, uh, and they're coming, you know, especially after the October 7th, but you will not see one voice who would say long live October 7th, long live the Palestinian armed resistance, long live you know, the Lebanese armed resistance. They will not say that. And that's because they view us as terrorists. They think we're terrorists. And so, so they believe so. They believe so. They, they believe that, you know, this is not the right way to go. And again, they place themselves as a colonialist. Uh, they have the upper hand to tell us what to do and how to struggle. That's their problem. Yeah, I get it. I mean, this is uh, this is understandable because I, they have done the same thing everywhere in the world. Like forever, there were colonies, whatever resistance, armed or not, everybody was called terrorists uh, at all points of time. So this does not uh, surprise me or surprise any of us. So I think uh, we have been here. By the way, it doesn't bother me. It doesn't oh. bother me. Oh, oh, no, 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 of course not. It does not bother anyone. It might even be a badge of honor or something. But anyway, so what I was saying that uh, we have uh, like we yeah, are been here bother. for like uh, more than I mean, more than an hour and a half. So we should probably try to close this up. Thanks a lot to you for coming to uh, coming once again. It has been like, I don't know, fourth, fifth time that you have been with us. And thanks a lot because every time you accept uh, wherever you are, I mean, at the moment you are in the heart of I mean, the center of the world's attention, I would say, hopefully. So, and we have joined from there. I, mean, I believe that despite uh, despite uh, threats. So, thanks a lot to you. And uh, like, if you have anything else, any other message, anything else to say, you could, uh, I mean, if this is the time I would say, then we'll just uh, 
close this up. I just want to thank you for inviting me again. And uh, I hope I was a light guest and, and not, uh, you know, uh, but I like to be here with you because I, I feel hope. And so we speak uh, our mind in a very uh, free environment. And I, I commend you and salute you uh, both for uh, uh, being the voice, uh, the you know forum for the Palestinian uh, people voice and for our collective voice. I see myself as part of your uh, efforts and uh, part of this family. So thank you. Thanks. Thanks a lot. It was an honor. I mean, it is always an honor to hear this, that Orinoco Tribune has done very little, like put its grain of sand in the beach or whatever it is. So thanks a lot to you and thanks a lot to Dalal, of course, for being here and especially despite my ter terrible weather here. I mean, it's, it's weather. Weather is doing this, not a war or anything. So thanks a lot to both of you. And uh, we hope that the resistance, of course, we hope the resistance wins.